afternoon, Milwaukee. This is the Mark Belling Late Afternoon Show on News Talk 1130 WISN. Every now and then I make a point. Sometimes they're the kind of points that I bring up all the time, in which I just try to hammer them because I really want them to sink in. I know how people are because I'm a person myself. A lot of times things go in one ear and out the other. On the one hand, people will come up to me and bring up something that I said like 20 years ago. How in the world do you possibly remember that? And I don't remember saying it. And often it's something that I wonder, well, why would you even remember that? That doesn't even seem all that interesting report. And it's usually something about some issue that affected them directly or something like that. Well, I mean, we make a lot of throwaway comments on the program, but there are other things in which I try to hammer them home because I really want you to understand them. And one of the points that I hammer all the time is we react far more strongly to that that we see than what we merely hear about or know about. I hope that has sunk in with you. It really makes me wonder how we reacted to anything before there was television. In other words, when nobody ever saw anything other than something that happened right in front of them, how did they ever have an opinion on it? And probably they were able to put things in better perspective than we are now. I use a lot of examples of this, and this is where the power of the media really comes in. Prior to all of these recent instances of police shootings and police beatings that have become controversial and so on, One of the big ones that we had in the United States was the beating of Rodney King back in the 90s. It was captured on video. It was right around the time that people started having home video devices and so on, and people reacted so strongly to it. As I've argued many times, if if Rodney King was merely beaten up by those same cops and there was no video of it, no one would have cared. But people saw it, and therefore they reacted to it more strongly than if they merely knew it happened. The other kinds of situations where this often occurs is when the media goes to discuss, goes into reports on some terrible human suffering in some other part of the world, and people will see these images, they react again far more strongly than if they merely hear about it. That's when the donations flow in. It's often when we're asked, well, what is the United States going to do about it and so on? You even watch these really manipulative television commercials. It's extraordinary they work. I want to turn them off because I understand what they are. They're manipulative and they're often for really, really bad organizations. But there'll be one on child abuse and there'll be one on abused animals. And they'll show you like three or four minutes. The commercials usually play late at night. And they run for three or four minutes and you'll show these dogs all beaten up and cats and so on. The Humane Society of the United States, which is a really, really bad organization, not to be confused with your local humane societies, they run some of them, so do a number of others, and they run them because they realize that if you show these images, people react more strongly than if you just come out and say, hey, give us money so we can fight animal abuse. And it works. We react more strongly to what we see than what we merely hear about or even know about. Why do I bring this up now? Well, I'm going to use an example of this, and we're going to have a lengthy discussion on the ramifications of the issue that I'm talking about. Because I believe something really significant has happened because this thing that I'm going to describe is something that people have seen. And to the extent that you have seen it, the more strongly people react to it. Do not misinterpret the following point. But, in a weird way, I said in a way, I don't mean on the overall, but in a way, we are benefiting from the way Democratic officials around the United States are responding to rioting. In a way. People like me have argued forever. 
Well, take that back. Not forever. People like me have been arguing for about the last five to ten years that Democrats have become radicalized, especially on matters pertaining to crime, law and order, and so on. And people like me have been arguing you can't count on them to protect you. And people like me have been arguing that the Democratic Party has been hijacked and it has become a radical organization. Now, even among those of you who may agree with that, I just have believed for the longest time now that it wasn't really sinking in. That you still have people, well, there's no difference between the Democrats and the Republicans, the D and the R, they're about the same thing. Whereas instead, the Democrats have become, as they say, a radical organization outside the American mainstream. Particularly when it comes to matters of law and order and protecting society. But I'm not sure that it's sunk in with that many people. But then, 2020 came around. And in not one isolated case, but in city after city after city after city after city. Rioters have torn these cities apart. There are some cities that have had multiple police officers shot and in some cases killed. Buildings destroyed. Out and out insurrection. Seattle had a zone, an anarchy zone, for weeks. Portland is essentially gutted as a city. San Francisco has block after block after block after block of bums sleeping on the street, crapping on the street, whizzing on the street, puking on the street. Chicago's downtown has been burned out and gutted twice. For three months, there's been insurrection in Wauwatosa. A section of Kenosha's downtown has been burned out. And in every one of those cases, despite the fact that the media has kind of tried to sanitize the whole thing, people have seen this. And they have a much stronger reaction when they see it. However, following points critical. Even with people seeing it, the reaction is strongest among the people who have actually experienced it. If you live in Grava City, Okadwag. You may not relate to how horrible it's been in Wauwatosa because it's not been your neighborhood. You see it and you say, well, okay, that's Wauwatosa. I'll take two cities that are very similar. In fact, a lot of people confuse them. There are two sets of cities in Wisconsin that people have confused forever. La Crosse and Eau Claire get confused. I tell the story all the time. I have a grandmother. Well, I don't have her anymore. I had a grandmother who was convinced the entire time I was in college, I went to Eau Claire. I went to La Crosse. She'd always say it. You're coming back from Eau Claire, Mark. I have my grandson's at Eau Claire. He's a student editor of the student newspaper at Eau Claire. I, I, I corrected her probably every single time. It just never sunk in. The other two cities that unless you're right from the region that a lot of people confuse are seen in Kenosha. Again, they're both in the southeast quarter of the state. They're a very, very similar size. They're both the county seats of counties that are named after the cities. They're both sort of blue collarish ethnic communities, and both have had large, prominent industrial employers there. So if you're not from that part of the state, a lot of people hear Racine and they think Kenosha, they hear Kenosha and they think Racine. Nonetheless, let's take those as an example. If you live in Racine, you're probably horrified 
at seeing what happened in Kenosha. But if you live in Kenosha, it's just different. It's even more. On the other hand, if you live in Racine, what happened in Kenosha has a greater dent on you than seeing what happened in Portland. Okay, Portland, that's Oregon, that's not what... Kenosha, that's here. We have come to realize in city after city after city after city after city, controlled by Democrats, and that's the key. The city has to be controlled by Democrats and the state involved has to be controlled by Democrats. That if riots break out, the Democrats will make the decision to allow the rioters to essentially do what they want, at least for a number of days. In Minneapolis, they let them do it for five days. On the other hand, in Portland, they've never stopped letting them do it. In Kenosha, they let them do it until the Democratic leaders of the city themselves demanded that it be stopped and got a proper amount of National Guard to come in. But in each of those cities, the rioters were allowed to riot and they were allowed to destroy homes. They were allowed to destroy businesses. They were allowed to terrify people. They were allowed to run amok. And seeing that happen, sanitized as the media coverage has been, it's had, I believe, a far greater impact on people that if I merely told you, well, you know, if this is going to happen, this is what they were going to do. And a lot of people might have said, yeah, they would do that. They would let them burn those. But to see them actually do it. There are several things that I've, that I've noticed over the last several days that have created the topic that I have here. First... For whatever reason, the interview that we did with Wauwatosa Mayor Dennis McBride has lived on forever in podcast land or something. Because every day I... We we did that. What did we do that? Two weeks ago, maybe? I'm asking you. When when did we do that? You you think about a week and a half ago. I think about two weeks ago. (laughs) It's probably like nine months. (laughs) Whatever it is. No, Two Rivers and Manitowoc are not communities that people mix up because Manitowoc is bigger than Two Rivers. I think most people know that, don't you? Like Two Rivers, Two Rivers to Manitowoc is like, I I don't actually, well, see, I'm I'm not really from up there, but I'm from that region. I mean, Two Rivers is way smaller. I mean, Two Rivers and and Manitowoc would be like Green Bay and De Pere in my mind, sort of, right? Why do you have that up there? You just trap me. Not Glendale and Greendale. No, nobody mixes those up. It's Greendale and Greenfield. <laughs> well, I mean, some people might mix up all of them. No, it's not when their names sound the same. It's like when they're right next to each other and they're like kind of, kind of identically. Sheboygan and Manitowoc actually would be a better example. They're two cities almost the exact same size. They're both on Lake Michigan. They're both, you know, between Milwaukee, you know, they're just far enough apart that they're different and they're just close enough together that you could see how people would mix them up. That's again another stupid example. This is what Sheboygan and Sheboygan Falls. Sheboygan Falls is like four people. Well, I mean, I'm serious. That's like somebody from Little Shoot saying they're the equivalent of Kakata. <laughs> Actually, Little Shoot and Kakata would be very similar. They're all the same size. Hey! We did the interview with Mayor McBride, and as I say, while he is completely all wet and his handling of the situation at Wauwatosa, I think, has been terrible, I've given him, I gave him credit. He wanted to come on the program and explain his point of view and... Even though I strongly criticized his point of view, I tried to let him make his point so that people knew where he was coming from. Better than a lot of these lefties who just hide under the table and speak only to the choir. But either people have posted it on social media themselves or it's on all these podcast services that are out there. But there are people who they must hear from somebody, hey, you got to listen to this or somebody will send it to them. And then I'll get a reaction to it now, even though we did the thing like two weeks ago. And I go, why are you reacting to this now? And it's because, well, they just heard it. What do I take from that? 
There are people that are truly stunned to hear a liberal mayor speak in the terms that Mayor McBride was speaking in which he said, yeah, I'm essentially going to allow them to keep breaking the law in my community. My goal is to have peace in the community, so if they're going to bust 19 million laws, I don't want to hack them off. To actually hear a liberal mayor say that has a greater impact on people than when somebody like me, Mark Belling, says, hey, this is what they think. It's like people can't believe they're actually now coming out and saying it. The next one. On my program several weeks ago, right a few days after the Kenosha riots, I shared with you an open letter that was written by a prominent Kenosha Democrat in which he said he was voting for Donald Trump. We posted it on Belling.com. It got very little outside media coverage because, again, the media has been sanitizing how horrified people are when they see how awful some of these riots are and how pathetically weak the response actually is. The reason that Democrat from Kenosha responded the way he did is it was his community that was burned out and gutted. My guess is that not as many Democrats in Racine are folding over because it wasn't their city that was burned out. But if a prominent Democrat is so fed up that he's going to write a letter publicly stating he's going to vote for President Trump, imagine what regular old, just non-prominent Democrats, regular old people are thinking. The next story. It's not directly related to the riots, but it's similar to it. A couple of months ago, I went to lunch with some friends of mine. I think I told the story. The uh, husband of the couple, he and his son, a couple of months ago were in San Francisco. He told me, you know, I had heard that they had all of these homeless people living on the street. We checked into our hotel. This was, uh, this might have been before coronavirus that, that he was telling this story because he was traveling and they went to a hotel. I don't think they would have been doing that now. Anyway, at least we walked out of the hotel. We're going to go, my, my son and I, and his son is an adult. We're going to look for a place to grab something to eat. And they wandered into block after block after block of all of these people on the streets. And not like one person here and one person there, but block after block after block of dozens, ultimately adding up to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people living on the street with human feces all over. And this is like the high-end neighborhoods of San Francisco. The guy was blown away by this. And again, he said, you know, I kind of knew this was going on, but seeing it, it's like I could, I, it was way worse than I guess I would have imagined. Again, the point that I make, we react far more strongly to that that we see than what we merely know about. We are seeing in America what happens when rioters decide to destroy a city, a suburb, a neighborhood, and their community is run by a Democrat. The answer is they let them do it. And then after they do it, even if they arrest a couple of them, they let them go the very next day. They allow them to do it. We don't try to stop anybody. We don't arrest anybody. We do literally nothing about it. And people are seeing this. And I keep getting these indications in which this reinforces... The impression that this is making on people. Advancing the discussion. I said we were going to take some time on this. There are two separate pieces today in the mainstream media that deal with this very issue. They were written completely independent of one another and they're about different takes on it. I'm going to get to the second one in a moment, but I'll tell you about it now. 
Politico. You've heard of it. It is a major online publication. Probably the most read online publication that covers politics in the United States. It's read by every mover and shaker that there is. They hired a ton of big people, and it's been around, I don't know, 15 years. Politico.com. It leans left. But it covers American politics and government. They have a major story today. Quoting a number of unnamed, some cases named, but mostly unnamed Democrats in Wisconsin who believe that Donald Trump might carry the state, and they believe that he might carry the state because of the miserable performance of Tony Evers relating relating to Kenosha. Now, that's an extraordinary story for a national news organization to come on to. Everybody knows that Wisconsin is considered maybe the most dead-even state in the country. It was shocking to many people that Trump carried it in 16, and it is of all the states that Trump took, the one that the Democrats are most obsessed with winning back. We hadn't gone for a Republican in a presidential election since the Reagan landslide of 84. Hillary was so sure that she was going to win that she didn't come to Wisconsin once in 16. So the Democrats put all this effort. I mean, the reason why they were planning to hold their goofy convention here before everything got called off was because they were putting so much focus, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. And as you know, they've been spending a fortune in advertising, especially digital advertising. Anyway, the premise of the political story, and I'm going to share it with you a little bit, but I want to plant the seed on it now because it relates to the other story I'm going to get into is there are a number of Democrats that are in out-and-out panic right now in this state who believe that the Kenosha riots have been a pivotal issue in opening people's eyes to the weakness of the Democratic Party. And they also believe that President Trump's hammering on it. As you know, Trump's been running television ads showing the Kenosha stuff over and over and over again. And these Democrats are furious with Tony Evers for his pathetic response. And so this national publication is pointing out. So in other words, you have Democrats out there who are concerned that the way their party is responding to these riots, sucking up to Black Lives Matter rather than protecting communities, protecting societies, and in many cases protecting even Democratic communities, is backfiring on them. The other story that I want to share with you first, after teasing the second one, because they're related, and as I said, I wanted to plant the seed. It's a mainstream media outlet, but the writer is not a liberal. Dan Henninger's column in the Wall Street Journal comes out every Thursday. As you know, I share it with the audience quite a bit. It's very well written, and he has interesting takes on things. His column today addresses this point that I'm making. He's sitting back and he is wondering, have the Democrats lost their minds? He writes about how seemingly politically disastrous it is to tell the world that you've legalized rioting. And Hennigy's point, and I'm going to share the column in a moment, is the whole country seeing all over America, Democrats won't do anything when there's a riot going on. They let people riot, and they let them do it day after day after day after day after day. And Hennigy's point is, do that? Do these Democrats not understand that this is not playing well in America, especially among the people, and here's the key point, where a riot might be more likely to occur? Now, I promise you, I will get to Hennigy, but I want to expand on that. As you know, and we've talked about this quite a bit, there has been a strategic decision made by the protest movement, BLM, Antifa, and others. They've wanted to get some of these riots, protests, demonstrations out of the place they normally... What happens when cop shoots an African-American prior to this year? They burn down the neighborhood where the cop shooting occurs. Well, they burn down their own neighborhoods. And the leadership of the movement has determined that we're not going to do that anymore. It's counterproductive. It just hacks off our own people. And if we think that there's racism from the whites, why are we burning down the black neighborhoods? So they have made a conscious effort to instead bring the violence to where the white people live. 
So when there's been demonstrations in cities, it's been in the downtowns. And they've tried very hard to take it out of the cities and into medium-sized cities and suburbs. I.e. Kenosha. Or Wauwatosa. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Now, they need a reason to choose that community. It usually has something to do with a police shooting or something or another. But they jump on those. But even still, Kenosha isn't Antigo. Antigo would be a city in north central Wisconsin. Kind of imagine between Green Bay and Wausau, way up there. The guy who lives in Attigo would think it's highly unlikely that there are going to be riots in his city if there's a police shooting. First of all, the minority population in Attigo would be small. And secondly, when you've noticed these things that have gone on in the medium-sized cities, they're usually rather close to large cities. Kenosha, what a perfect storm, halfway between Milwaukee and Chicago. Wauwatosa, borders of the city of Milwaukee. Somebody who lives in Kenosha or Racine or Wauwatosa or even Sheboygan would know that they would have be at greater risk of a, of a riot going on than somebody in Wausau, farther removed, more kind of in the middle of nowhere. Or somebody who lives in a sub, like somebody like Paul. I mean, for you to tell somebody how to come to your house, you probably have to, well, we all have GPS now, but I mean, it's not like one straight shot and you're not on a main drag. Whereas Wauwatosa, right down North Avenue, right down Blue Mountain Road, you're there. Kenosha, right down I-94, take, take a left on Highway 50 and head toward the lake. Simple. See my point? Whereas if you live in one of these shady tree lane, Holly View, Meadow Branch subdivisions where everything's named after a tree and you look at the map and everything curves and then they have these cul-de-sacs and every street comes to a dead end. You know those kind. That's kind of like where you live, isn't it? It's where you Someone like that probably still kind of thinks, well, it can't ever happen to me. It's not like they're going to find my house and burn me out. They'll never find me. So even though there's been a conscious attempt to bring some of this stuff to the suburbs, I would think that a person who lives in a subdivision in Muskego would feel at far less risk than someone who lives, for example, in Wauwatosa or Brookfield. In other words, one of those main drag accessible kind of communities. But let's imagine, and this is where Henninger's column comes from, Let's grab one of those medium-sized cities that is potentially a target if, God forbid, some sort of trouble would happen there. I'll give you an example of one where you could certainly fathom it happening. Maybe I shouldn't even say it. Like a community like Mequon. Again, that's an accessible, easy one. Right up I-43, and they've got that, it's not so much a downtown as the southeast corner where the shopping centers are and so on. It would be a convenient area, and if there was going to be a riot, that would be where it would be. The person who lives in Mequon would probably have greater reason to be concerned than somebody who lives in a tucked away part. Well, in fact, there is a community that has had trouble off and on for the last number of months. Port Washington, again, very, very easy. It's on a main drag. You can see something like that happening there as opposed to in a less urbanized suburban area where you're off kind of in, you know what I mean. So Henninger's point is, the people who live in these communities now, where they now realize it might happen here and my leaders might not do anything to stop it, This is having an incredible impact on them. And he's wondering, have the Democrats lost their marbles? His belief is that this issue is one that can turn a Democrat into a Republican. And it's certainly an issue that can turn a swing voter into a Republican. 
Now, I'm doing a long buildup on this because I think that this whole topic that I'm mentioning here of we are getting a firsthand look of not only how soft on crime the Democrats are, but I think it's now fair to say that the Democratic Party is the pro-riot party, right? Is that not fair to say? Tony Evers, well, uh, Tony Evers has said he wouldn't change a thing, right? Well, but Kenosha, a, a huge segment of Don Kenosha is burned out, and Tony Evers is not bothered by how he handled it. If he's not bothered by how he handled it, I guess that means he thinks it's just fine that that part of Kenosha is burned out, right? I don't think that that's an exaggerated point. At no point have we heard any of these people come out and either A, do anything about it, or B, say that it's terrible. You'll get a little bit like in Portland after four months, the mayor started to hand ring a little bit, even though he's been empowering this stuff and going on. Hand rings a little bit, then they protest at his house, and then he goes back inside and shuts up. So I'm going to share with the audience after all of this buildup, but I think it's worth it. As I said at the introduction of the program, this is one of those topics that I'm kind of not being subtle about pounding you over the head with it. I want it to sink in. I'm going to go to a break here, then I'm going to share the Henninger column. And we will be addressing that political piece on Democrats furious with how Tony Evers botched the Kenosha situation. Do you want to plug something? 5.45 every Thursday afternoon, we've got the Mark Belling Weekend Football Preview. Uh, Mike Berlet of ASA is going to be joining me. We'll take a look. It's about a five to seven minute segment we plan to do every week. Um, Holiday Automotive of Fond du Lac. It's worth the drive. That's their line. You get that? It's worth the drive. See, they sell cars. You drive. And it's and it's in Fond du Lac. Well, yeah, if you live in Fond du Lac, it'd be worth a very, very tiny kind of a drive. Why do you do, see? This is all your fault, unless you live in Fond du Lac. Wait, what? You no, know, if you lived in Fond du Lac, it would still be worth the drive, wouldn't it? It just wouldn't be much of a drive. But I'm explaining your slogan. Well, apparently they're very happy with the slogan, so I explain the slogan. One of the shows that you know that I watched. I think I just told this story, but I'm going to tell it again. When Mad Men was initially, I forget, did you watch Mad Men as it came on one week at a time, or did you binge watch it well after the fact? After the fact. See, I was on it, I watched the very first episode, you know, the night that it was on. So you'd watch like 13 episodes or whatever a season would be, but what a week, and it would take 13 weeks, and then a year would go before season two would come along. So it took years for me to go from beginning to end. And then... After it was all over, like three years passed, I binge watched the whole thing. And I realized that the second time around, I thought it was even more brilliant than the first time that maybe the impact of the binge watching had an incredible impact on me. But it was just, it's, I think, one of the greatest TV shows ever. And when I, uh, you agree with that, don't you? Yeah. Paul says it's in his top three. Well, it was said in the advertising business, and one of the things that they would do when they would create an advertising campaign is they would assign people to stick with the first thing you do often is start writing tags. A tag is like a slogan. And you come up with hundreds of them so just so you could find the right one. And once you had the slogan, then you go backwards and build the campaign around it. So in the advertising business, they're very, very happy with their slogans. And you hear many of the advertisers we hear, they have they they have like their slogans and some of them are obsessive with their what the name of their slogan is. And some people wonder why do they keep hammering home that slogan? Trust me, if you have a slogan, you're like, you, you just you're in love with your slogan. Well, I say standing up for Milwaukee all the time. I used to say uncommon common sense, and I kind of moved away from that because I thought the point was almost obvious. It almost went without saying, but really true now. Anyway, uh, football picking contest is sponsored by Holiday Automotive, and we'll be doing that at five forty-five. Uh, this uh, Thursday afternoon throughout the football season. If there happens to be a day that I'm not out on a Thursday, we might move it around or so. We haven't even figured that part of it out. But it's kind of a replacement of a football contest. We're just doing it different this year for 97 zillion reasons. So that's the plug. And ba- one baseball game is too long. So when you play two of them and you miss the first game and you tune on the second one and it's only plus, uh, the one I missed last night was the one the Brewers lost. I'd watch game two, which is the one they won. Let me, I'll get to Henninger's column, but I think I've said this on the air, but if I didn't, Keston Hira is the new Garmin Thomas. The Brewers over their history have had two or three guys that are kind of like this, all or nothing guys. 
Another one that some people might not remember, remember that little, it was a shorter career, the Richie Sexton period in Milwaukee. I think he must have, I bet he had 45 home runs one year for the Brewers. I know it was an incredible number, but his batting average is like 218 or 220 or 222. What? So I got our home run, and that's what Gorman Thomas was throughout his career. I mean, the year that the Brewers went to the World Series, I believe Gorman hit over 40 home runs, and I think he hit 240. And Keston Hero has become the same thing. The difference is Richie Sexton looked like an all-or-nothing guy, and Gorman Thomas looked like an all-or-nothing guy. Hero looks like Rod Carew. I mean, he looks like a guy that'd be slapping singles around. Keston hit another home run last night, and I know it doesn't sound like a lot to say he has 13 home runs. I just did some quick math during the break. He's hit 13 home runs in 49 games. If this is a 162-game season, he would have 43 home runs a year. Yet he can't get a single or a double to save his life. He's hitting, as I said, about 222, but he keeps hitting these home runs. He's the most unusual all-or-nothing guy. So another guy like that. He played for the, a few teams, but I remember mostly for the Cubs in, I think, the 70s. There's a name that, a blast from the past. Remember Dave Kingman? Paul does not. Um... It might have been a little bit before you paid attention to baseball. It would have right have been in the area where I, as a kid, was paying close attention. These are the Cubs, I think, the 70s. I don't think it was the 80s yet. I think it was before that. It's the first baseman. I, I know I have a little bit of this wrong. I think he was like 6'9". <laughs> I'm not making that up. He was just unbelievably tall guy, and he took this big swing, and it was like a golf swing, and he would either strike out or hit the ball, you know, eight miles over that stupid left field fence that they have out onto that street. What are you sensing? Zero interest in the Brewers right now. That might change. That you know. Well, this is now. There's 11 games left, and they are right on the bubble for the playoffs. If they make, if they make the playoffs, then people will get interested. I suspect. But as I said, the thing about the Brewers is, for a team that's not very good, they are the ideal playoff team because they've got all these pitchers that can shut guys out for two or three innings and. As you saw last year, uh, Craig Council manages that type of environment really, really well. I mean, the Brewers can't hit at all, but got all these pitchers that can do all this, this, that, and the other thing. Don't remember Dave Kingman, huh? Like I said, I, he, I, he might not have been 6'9", but he was at least 6'7". He was like Randy Johnson, only a hitter, and all he would do is hit home runs or strikeout. All right, my little branching off. Now, getting back to... The Dan Henninger column, and I break this up a little bit because I want to spend nearly two hours on this whole area of it's sinking into the American public that the Democrats will not protect you from a riot and they're just going to allow it to continue to go on and that this is the new normal in the United States, that they simply do not believe that homeowners and businesses should be protected when there's a riot that's being conducted, so long as the riot is coming from a left-wing organization, particularly those that are speaking out on behalf of some sort of a minority group. Dan Henninger's column is that this is a political disaster, that this is not a pro-riot country, that most Americans believe in law and order. He writes, How crazy does the violence have to get before it costs the Harris-Biden campaign the election. Nomenclature update on Monday. Kamala Harris referred in public to something she called the Harris administration in a speech the next day. Biden himself referred to a Harris-Biden administration. If that's how they want it, that's fine by me. From now on, it's the Harris-Biden campaign. Then he continues. For weeks, analysts have been pondering whether the law and order issue elevated by President Trump and the Republican convention could have a material effect on voting this fall. Generally, they have minimized the issue. But, like the hurricanes rolling in from the Atlantic Ocean, the waves of urban violence have apparently become impossible to ignore. A Monmouth poll out this week finds, now follow these numbers, 65% of respondents say maintaining law and order is a big problem. Now let me interject. 65% in terms of polling is a huge number. We are so divided in this country. Half the country thinks one thing, half the country thinks the other thing. I just about everything. But on this one, you get a big consensus. And they didn't just say it's important. They said big. 65% said maintaining law and order is a big problem. The poll's self-identified affiliations are, now what does that mean? 
This is who they polled. 28% of the respondents describe themselves as Republican, 31% Democratic, and 41% Independent. So that 65% comes from a group in which only 28% of the respondents called themselves Republicans. In other words, this is a real cross-section point of view. Here's the elect. This is headed, you know. Here's the election's ticking time bomb among non-Republican blacks and other minorities. In other words, blacks and other minorities who are not Republicans. More than 60% agree that civil disorder has become a big issue. While just 46% of white non-Republicans see it as a problem. Now let me slow down here because those numbers come at you really fast. Henninger is pointing out that of people who aren't Republican, blacks and minorities feel civil disorder is a bigger problem than non-Republican whites. Now why would that be? Who's a non-Republican white? People who live in the more affluent areas probably don't have to worry about this. Non-Republican minorities, they're in the crosshairs of this. That's somebody who lives in Sherman Park. Back to the column. Looks like where one lives explains a lot about the Democratic worldview. He continues, there's more bad news at the wrong moment for Harris Biden. Conclusive evidence has emerged that the American left is certifiably insane. After the shooting this week of two cops in Compton, south of Los Angeles, a small contingent of anti-police protesters stood outside a hospital chanting, We hope they die. Biden tweeted criticism of both incidents as unacceptable and entirely counterproductive. Now think about that. That was the rhetoric of Joe Biden over two cops being shot and then people going to the hospital and chanting, we hope they die. Biden's condemnation is, the mild words of, unacceptable. Counterproductive. Back to Henninger. We don't make the left is insane charge lightly. Up to now. The conventional liberal media Democratic storyline has been that, quote, most of the protesters are peacefully objecting to racism and police practices. But it has become impossible not to see something else that falls between carrying signs and looting stores. I want to share my own story about that later. Henninger continues, it is common practice for these protesters, men and women, to stand inches from the faces of cops, especially black cops, screaming insults and personal obscenities with no let-up. We showed some of that video, I think I linked it up for you a couple of weeks ago in Wabatosa. Screaming endlessly in the faces of these police officers. This behavior is a phenomenon worth talking about. That's Hedinger. It wasn't long ago. Now, this is where his column, I think, just, I'm reading it slowly. And as I said, I really, really want this to sink in. He writes, it wasn't long ago that everyone but the genuinely insane knew that if you did that to a cop, odds are you would be A, arrested, and or B, popped with a billy club. Indeed, that's the reality of my life. Until this year. If you got there and screamed vulgarities in a cop's face for 15 minutes, you'd be, you, you just knew you'd be arrested or maybe likely the cop would crack you one, right? That's what everyone has sort of known would happen. Hedinger's point is that's all changed. But these protesters get up into the face of the police shrieking because they know, A, they will not be arrested. B, if they are arrested, they will be released quickly. And C, They will be released because the prosecutors in these cities probably won't press charges. Instead, prosecutors are looking for reasons to cite the police for acts of violence. This is new. A status quo in which there is no fear of the police, 
by protesters or common street criminals. A line in the sand has been washed away. Now let me interject. This is where he's going. There's a line in the sand that pretty much everybody knew existed. Certain things you couldn't do to a cop and get away with it. And everybody is now seeing that that's gone. That certain people are allowed to show unbelievably abusive behavior to police officers. Now, the point that Henninger is making is most Americans don't think this is good. They are seeing that this is what the Democrats have decided to order. Their police to stand down and sit there and take it. Back to Henninger's column. This condition didn't happen in the past 100 days. Democratic politics has been building toward precisely this redefinition of law and order for at least 20 years. Embarrassed and perplexed by the decades-long persistence of crime and incarceration in inner-city neighborhoods, progressive legal theorists proposed decriminalization as an alternative. They essentially redefined crime as something closer to a behavior problem. And they blame the police function for incarceration rights. Let me interject. You've been hearing them for the last few years talk about mass incarceration, that that's a bad thing. In other words, instead of describing the crime problem as a bad thing, describe the fact that we are locking too many people up, that that's the bad thing. So Hanninger's pointing out that that's the thing that's been building. The Democrats simply no longer believe that for many classes of criminals that they ought to be punished at all. That the problem is instead that the police should just be let it be. He continues. The argument appealed to many liberals living in low crime zip codes. I.e., you know, Shorewood, Whitefish Bay, Madison. The North Shore of Chicago, Evanston, places like that. Relatively low crime, but overwhelmingly liberal. The argument appealed to many liberals living in low crime zip codes who have elected progressive prosecutors in Philadelphia, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, Dallas, San Antonio, Seattle, Orlando, St. Louis, the New York City boroughs of Queens and elsewhere. An important political document in this evolution was rendered in July. The Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force. Note that it appeared one month after the protests, looting, and urban shootings began in May. Under the Biden-Sanders heading, Protecting Communities by Reforming Our Criminal Justice System, the words felony, homicides, or gangs appear nowhere. It's almost entirely about one thing, the police, and reducing their role. Shootings appears once in regard to to police shootings. Now, let me interject. In fact, the Democrats aren't denying any of this stuff. What was their big mantra after George Floyd? Defund the police, defund the police, defund the police, defund the police, defund the police. They used it as the opportunity to do the thing that they have most wanted to do about crime, get rid of cops. Their thinking is the fewer cops there are, the fewer people will be arrested, and now we can pretend that we don't have much crime because we're simply not going to be charging anybody with it anymore. Back to Henninger. Subsequent proposals on the official Biden campaign website overwhelmingly reflect these policies. The Democrats' failure at their convention to mention the violence wasn't just avoidance of an inconvenient reality. It was a conscious ideological choice to restate a point made previously in this space. There will be no return to normal if Harris Biden wins. Let me interject. Many people think, oh, this will all end after the election. Democrats get back in charge. We'll go back. No. Henninger's point is that on this issue, they are true believers, believers that the leadership of this party does not believe in enforcing the law, and they're demonstrating it already by in city after city after city after city simply not enforcing the law. If the people that are violating the law are violating a law that lefties are not bothered by, like rioting. Back to the column. The political problem for Democrats and Joe Biden, surfaced by the Monmouth poll, is that the post-Floyd protests put the progressive urban policing model to an unexpected real-world test, which it has failed demonstrably and disastrously. 
In other words, his point is, okay, we've tried it out this summer. The way the lefties want to do the crime thing. Don't let the police... We see the result. It's a disaster! The mayor of Wauwatosa doesn't seem to know it. His response is a disaster. Tony Evers, I wouldn't change a thing in Kenosha. Kenosha was a disaster. Chicago, not arresting anybody when riots occur. States through Michigan Avenue, then they occur again, still didn't arrest. It's a disaster. So Henninger concludes, it has led not to what President in the Wings Harris this summer described as reimagining how we do public safety in America, but instead a virtual collapse of the police function. The result is an abrupt spike in urban crime. I might point out, at the same time this is going on, we've had dramatic increases in the murder rate in cities like Milwaukee and so on. And the firing in Milwaukee of a police chief who was trying to do something about it. Again, you see what happens when liberals are put in charge. And Henninger's point is, is that we are trying out what they've wanted to do right now this year. It's a nightmare. Let me go back and start the sentence. The result is an abrupt spike in urban crime and mob-like political protesters exploiting official restraints on police. It's a perfect, still-raging storm of progressive failure, which now means democratic failure. So, my argument. The democratic left has turned certifiably insane. If one definition of irrational behavior is the refusal to recognize the damage being done, primarily to black and Hispanic neighborhoods, by catastrophic violence, voters, it appears, have begun to notice. Now, we don't link up Wall Street Journal columns at Belling.com, as I've explained in the past, because many of them are behind a paywall. So if you want to find it, dive into the Wall Street Journal. But that's Dan Henninger's column today. His point is that politically, this may be coming home to haunt the Democrats more immediately because everyone sees it happening. And my additional point, the big cities where it's occurred and the medium-sized cities where they've occurred, cities like Tosa, Kenosha, those are swing cities and swing areas. Not radically liberal yet. This is an eye-opener for them. I think back to when we started describing people as Reagan Democrats. In other words, Democrats who voted for Reagan because they thought that the left had gone too far and many people identified the same phenomenon in 2016. Trump Democrats, people who middle class, often union types, blue collar types, who felt that neither political party was listening to them. I think you've got this new phenomenon in 2020 where people who live in neighborhoods and areas that suddenly have seen either an increase in regular crime or have seen their communities destroyed by either protesting or their quality of life eroded by the raucous obnoxiousness night after night after night after night after night by Wamatosa, And they have come to realize that Democrats simply think we should let people do this. We shouldn't stop them at all. We shouldn't arrest them. We shouldn't stop them from blocking streets. We shouldn't stop them from anything. You can go into Kenosha and en masse burn down buildings with one, two, maybe three arrests. When the president offers to give you thousands of National Guardsmen, the governor turns him down that the mayor of Kenosha initially said we didn't need it. This sinks in. It's dawning on people because, and this goes back to my beginning discussion. It's one thing to hear hear, to know about something, but it's something else to actually see it. We're seeing democratic policing and democratic policies on crime and democratic policies on riot in action right now. And it's not a stretch to think that the next five cities where this stuff is going to occur, the exact same thing is going to happen. This is not a mainstream position, even though it's been a democratic position. Let me go to the break here. 
I think, you know, we have these wave elections in America now. Whoever people vote for at the top of the ticket, they tend to vote all the way down for that political party. You saw, for example, in 2018 in Wisconsin, not only did Governor Walker lose, we lost the attorney general's race, and the margin is almost exactly the same. In other words, everybody who voted for Evers also voted for Josh Call and so on. So it tends to work. 2010 in Wisconsin, the Republicans won everything. Scott Walker and Ron Johnson won with almost the exact same percentage of the vote. If anything, this crime issue could be one that affects down-ballot races. Because you're talking about elected officials in your local communities and your local states, and people have come to see now what the Democrats stand for. As an example, we talked about Wauwatosa, the state assembly district that straddles Wauwatosa and Brookfield. Kind of like most of Tosa and then Eastern Brookfield is the one that's represented by Robin Viding. Robin Viding is a big time lefty who has been a supporter of the anti police protests and a supporter of the commotion that's occurred in Wauwatosa. She and her close buddy, Heather Cool, member of the city council, they're part of this whole Tosa Together movement, they're anti police pro-demonstration, et cetera. I think that if there's a political impact here and some people who are swing voters are maybe lean Democrat, but they're horrified over the crime issue, that isn't just going to affect the presidential vote. It might affect some of these things right down the line. And if it doesn't, if Vining gets reelected, Wauwatosa and Brookfield are essentially saying they support exactly what's been going on. Carry on and rant and rave every single night. Fire a gunshot into the girlfriend of a police officer's house and watch only one person get arrested. Watch a Democratic member of the state assembly lie and claim the cop shot himself. And see not one single other Democrat, including Robin Vining, condemn David Bowen for being the bald-faced liar that he is. Again, all this stuff's kind of out there in broad daylight. And while it's certainly true that the media sanitized it and not covered it with much intensity... Pretty much everybody's noticed it. Who hasn't noticed Wauwatosa? Who hasn't wa- noticed Kenosha? Who hasn't noticed Chicago? Who in the world hasn't noticed Portland? We've all seen it. We've seen that this is what the Democratic Party believes in. And if after this election is over, they win, they're going to double down and insurrection, so long as the insurrectionists are from their side, is essentially going to be allowed. Henninger's conclusion, for a political party to take on that position is certifiably insane because it is not within the mainstream of where the American public is. A lot of questions from the audience about that whole fake diamond thing. People ask me whether or not they think that the value of them will crash or not. Well, what do I know? What? How can I answer that question? I mean, because I have opinions on things like this, I guess people ask me that. I know my attitude on the whole thing, however. I think I mentioned that my 20s when I was in New York City, I bought a fake Rolex on the street. street. And, you know, 25 years later, I got enough money that I bought an actual Rolex. Bought it used. I bought it in the islands and it was legitimate. I still not at the point where I can justify paying full price for a Rolex. But now I think it would be terrible that somebody would wear a fake Rolex like that. On the other hand, I think the way that you look at almost anything like that when they try to replicate something when something is fake is, if you don't intend to resell it, you can say, maybe, what do I care? Yeah, a coach versus the Gucci, anything that has, uh, what's the other one with the, uh, um, they're, they're kind of brown with the gold letters and they all look exactly the same with the same symbols on it, same symbol on it. Every bag and thing that they do, it's the same pattern. It's not Gucci. It's the other one. It's not Gucci. It's not coach. It's the third one. There's three that are, when you go to the department stores, they all have their, they're all right next to each other. There's coach, Gucci. It's two words, I think. Why isn't the audience help? Louis Vuitton. That's it. Yeah, if you intend to ever sell it, I, I would say don't do it. But if you're just going to look at it yourself and try to con the rest of the world, well, then maybe it would be worthwhile. So, I mean, right. I mean, so I mean, if I bought a diamond, I think I would probably 
you know, one of the reasons people push buying diamonds is that it's not something that depreciates. It often can appreciate. Same thing with a home, that you buy it and years later you sell it and it's worth more than when you originally bought it for, as opposed to most things in life where you use it and run the thing into the ground. Anyway, I said I wanted to devote an extended period of time to the eye-opening experience that many Americans are seeing in which they have come to realize that the Democratic Party in this country will not do anything to stop violent crime, violent protests, insurrection, rampant law-breaking, everything down to, at the lower level, blocking the streets, honking the horns and disturbing the peace, and at the highest level, actually shooting and killing people or burning out a city like Kenosha. And that even when it occurs, the worst you can get is a mild condemnation. Joe Biden, well, it's unfortunate that the two cops are killed. It's counterproductive that you were chanting, we hope they die. That's all he could say. Tony Evers after Kenosha, yeah, I did a good job. I wouldn't change anything. The eye-opening nature of that. I mentioned earlier in the discussion There's a national piece out today in which you have a number of Democrats, some using their names, but most whispering quietly that they believe that it's possible Trump will win Wisconsin again solely because Tony Evers butchered Kenosha. I know the Trump people are pushing this thing hard on the crime, that the direct mail pieces that are going out and the ads that they're running are just trying to emphasize here because this point is obvious. Attorney General Barr is encouraging local prosecutors, federal prosecutors, to use sedition laws to go after violence. The Republicans believe that the American public does not believe in this type of violence, whereas it's apparent that the Democrats think it's apparently just fine. Tony Evers, well, so what? Which is essentially what he said. I want to pick up on that national piece from Politico when we come back. 421 News Talk, 1130 WISN. Standing up for Milwaukee, this is the Mark Belling Late Afternoon Show. On News Talk, 1130 WISN, Milwaukee Pius High School has decided to shut its doors. They were operating on an in-person basis. One kid tested positive, and they're going virtual. I said this at the beginning. I mean, if the schools are not committed to riding through the inevitable outbreaks where people get the virus, they may as well not open at all. The virus is out there. People are getting it all over the country. In most cases, they get it and they don't even know they have it, but they'll get it because they're tested. If you're going to run around and hide every time somebody gets it, then don't open it in the first place. And that's going to be the case, I suspect, for a couple of years until it works through. It's really disconcerting when you see this occur, not from a public school, but from a Catholic school. And you wonder, well, what's the point of finding an alternative to the public school if the people who are running the Catholic schools are just as pig-headed and lacking a commitment to doing what's right for the kids rather than worrying about a bunch of crybaby teachers? Now, if the teachers at Pius oppose this and they condemn the decision because they're not afraid of contracting a virus that in most cases doesn't even make you sick... I apologize, but I've gotten word from a number of parents there that they're just furious about one kid. That's a huge school. Every school that opens is going to have somebody get this. Every single one in the United States is going to have somebody get it and probably a lot get it. In the same way that when you open to this, that, or the other thing. It's going to happen because the virus is all over the place. It's all over the place, but what isn't all over the place is anybody that actually doesn't feel very good off of it because the virus has become, other than for high-risk people... Not that big of a deal, which is why the only reason we know that anybody has it is because they hit a positive test. Let's move back into the area that we've been discussing. And for those of you just coming into the program, I said I wanted to spend a long time on what I think is potentially a transformative issue in this election, but it's certainly transformative about what is happening in the United States. It used to be a given that both political parties would both say and pretty much practice, respect the police, respect the law. Both sides would say they're pro-police. Both sides would say they're pro-law and order. They might disagree on how you play it out, but that was a given in the United States. What's happened over the last couple of years is that the Democrats have turned anti-police in their rhetoric. 
And in 2020, after these two years of turning anti-police in their rhetoric, we have suddenly found that they are also no longer in support of enforcing the law if the violators of the law are people that are on their side. We've seen a dramatic increase in violent crime separate from the riots. And a major attempt toward defunding police and trying to reduce the number of arrests and so on. What was going on with the Blasio in New York where he essentially defanged the police department and said he didn't want any real enforcement actions going on? It's too racist. That was before coronavirus and so on. And now we've seen in city after city after city after city after city, protesters who don't commit violence, are still able to be unbelievably disruptive day after day after day after day, can violate whatever laws they want, drive their cars on people's grass, honk their horns in the middle of the night, block streets, harass people at their homes, breaking any number of laws, all the way up to, on the extreme end, you could riot and try to torch out a city as occurred in downtown Chicago and occurred in Kenosha, And Democrats will really not try to stop you. And it isn't just one or two Democrats. Using the Kenosha situation as an example, the county executive cruiser and the mayor, Antaramian, both Democrats, although elected nonpartisan, they were just as impotent as Tony Evers. I indicated when I came on my program the Monday of the week of the Kenosha riots that they needed to get 3,000 National Guardsmen, and 3,000 was the number that I cited, that you needed to be ahead of this right away, and you had to be aggressively proactive. Every single law that you saw being violated, try to get the people into the paddy wagon immediately. And instead, Kenosha did just the opposite. Kenosha was wiped out, sections of the city at least. And the inevitable occurred when the police... And law enforcement were not there to be able to do their job or maintain order. Some citizens were going to take the law into their own hands and the Rittenhouse situation occurred. This is an eye-opener for many Americans. They now realize the Democrats don't believe in supporting the law and they essentially think that rioting is okay. If they didn't think it was okay, they'd try to stop it. Anarchy is now perfectly fine with them. Both of them, as I say, the low-level, Wauwatosa, just every single night. And by the way, we hear that there's going to be another night in Wauwatosa. The Police and Fire Commission meets tonight. So the People's Revolution, that's what they call themselves, the People's Revolution. By the way, we've linked up on Belling.com. One of the leaders of the People's Revolution, that's the movement in Wauwatosa, is a veteran criminal who has open criminal cases. It's a criminal. The story was reported by... Wisconsin Right Now, which is a new conservative publication, and we've linked up to their reporting on my site. The political component of this, as I've been saying, you can tell people something over and over and over again, but until they see it, it doesn't have the same impact on them. You have all over the United States of America, the American public watching Democrats refusing to enforce the law, refusing to condemn shootings of police officers like in Los Angeles, refusing to protect cities that are being torched out. You have all over the state of Wisconsin people seeing Tony Evers saying, no, I wouldn't have done anything different in Kenosha. Essentially, wink, wink, nod, nod, okay, fine, we gave you three days to burn out the city. That's what Kenosha deserves because a police officer shot someone. That's what Evers was saying. In the meantime, you have some Democratic politicians who have a different agenda. Their agenda is they just want to win everything. The political strategist types, the ones that are trying to regain control of the state Senate, and the Democrats really want to get the state Senate in this election. Why? It's after this election that we do the redistricting. They want to draw the lines pro-Democratic, and if they have the governor's office and the Senate, they think they can get that done. Well, these Democrats, the ones that care about winning, they're in panic mode because they believe that this issue of being pro-riot, anti-police could cost Wisconsin the state, the state to the Republicans. We know this because there's a national media piece out today on Politico.com. As I mentioned earlier, Politico is probably 
of the online political publications that are out there the most widely read. It leans left. And Politico has come into Wisconsin and they have a major piece out today that quotes a number of Democrats, some by name, some not by name, saying they now fear that Donald Trump is going to carry the state again in 2020 and they're blaming it on Tony Evers. Now, Evers' defenders say that his poll ratings remain rather high. The political piece states as its premise that there are a number of Democrats who believe that Evers' disastrous handling of Kenosha is playing right into, into, into Trump's argument that you can't trust Democrats to protect you. Now, my take on it is Of course it's playing into Trump's argument. We've seen in Wisconsin, you can't trust Democrats to protect you. Milwaukee had a police chief who was law and order. Tom Barrett's Fire and Police Commission fired him. Wauwatosa has a a, a liberal mayor. He will do nothing to restore any type of order to the community. And Kenosha? You could riot three nights out and burn the city out, and the governor won't respond until the mayor of the city finally wakes up and begs for federal law enforcement, federal National Guardsmen to come in with sufficient force to show order. The reason that Evers may cost the Democrats the state is because everybody knows what happened in Kenosha. You don't have to make it up and say this is what's going to happen. It happened. The headline in the Politico story, which shows a picture of Evers and his constant shadow figure, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, standing behind him. The headline reads, Dems fear Wisconsin governor is becoming a liability for Biden. The subhead, Tony Evers' performance, especially his response to the Kenosha riots, is diminishing what should be a significant edge for the party. The story is written by Natasha Karecki and was posted this morning. It's a long piece, so I can't read the entire thing for you on Belling.com. I'm going to read the operative paragraphs about Kenosha. This is from Politico, posted today. His response to the Kenosha unrest has hurt, has hurt Evers' lost ground in the Marquis State Poll from August to September, which is when the unrest in Kenosha began. He was accused of moving too slowly to, to deploy enough National Guard troops to quash unrest after the police shooting of Jacob Blake. Evers sent troops on the first night of the riots, declared a state of emergency, and doubled the number of troops the second night. But it wasn't enough to quell violence or destruction in the town. Two days after Blake's shooting, protesters clashed with armed militia and three protesters were shot, two fatally, by 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse, who was charged with homicide. Furious local officials from both parties sent a scathing letter to the governor. Our community is in a state of emergency and we need additional law enforcement to help preserve and save Kenosha County. We encourage you to visit Kenosha County and see firsthand the destruction that has been inflicted on our community, the letter read. Angela Jarrett of Kenosha said the violence during the riots left an indelible mark on their community. One that Jarrett said she believes will be with her young children for life. They listened to cars exploding at night, she said. This is going to be there forever, just like 9-11 is my forever. President Trump has pilloried Evers as feckless. The president pointed out that Evers had turned down federal help to contain the unrest. Rose, that's a county official in Kenosha, Democrat, said anger is still palpable among Kenosha residents and business owners who lost their livelihoods feared for their lives or watched their town burn before their eyes. He made a grave strategic error. They were allowed to run rampant and burn and burn and burn, said Rose, who was also an attorney. I am highly disappointed in the response from the governor. This is about the public safety and the lifeblood of this community. 
who has the governor really helped? I think he helped the Trump campaign. Not the Biden campaign, unwittingly. In an interview, former Governor Scott Walker called Evers' response to various crises weak and agreed they're a vulnerability for Democrats not only in November but in 2022. When Evers is up for re-election, Walker and party leaders have already gotten behind Walker's former Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Clayfish to run for governor. The story then goes on and explains why Walker did not support the ongoing political recall. And so on. Anyway, the premise of the lengthy story in Politico is that here in Wisconsin, and I think I would add that the Kenosha thing is damning to Evers in Wisconsin because it is cumulative. Kenosha occurred after Madison. You saw night after night after night after night of violence in Madison, the destruction, the second worst of any city in the state. Kenosha, of course, been the worst. The violence and the rioting on State Street in Madison night after night after night was worse than what we saw in Milwaukee. Right underneath Evers' nose, and night after night after night after night, he and the Democrats did nothing about it. Then, the night that all hell broke loose. They destroyed statues at the Capitol, including those of liberal icons. A Democrat, and I still believe they knew who he was, a Democratic State Senator Tim Carpenter was almost killed for attempting to take a photo, which these rioters hate. Carpenter was knocked to the ground, badly injured. And then they went over to the big giant city county building, which includes the Dane County Jail, and tried to firebomb it. They saw Evers do nothing as that built every single night. Then Kenosha comes. The same thing happened. They saw Evers do again nothing. Does this harm Evers in the Fox Valley and in northern Wisconsin? Maybe not as much. But among swing voters down here, I think quite a bit. Everyone's been focusing on the so-called female suburban voter. It's been a weakness for President Trump. Those voters focus heavily on issues of personal safety, security, and so on. This has to be alarming. It's one thing for Trump to say, in Trump's own fashion, the Democrats aren't going to protect you. People watched. The Democrats didn't protect us. And everyone knows that if there's another outburst, if something happens somewhere tomorrow night, Tony Evers and the Democrats will not protect them there either. Whether it be a police shooting or let's imagine there's a police chase and someone's injured or there's an African American, whatever the thing is. And the rioters decide to show up there. We all know the Democrats will let that city get torched too. Now, you could say it's not just Evers. Democratic leaders are doing this all over America. That's true. I believe that the swing voter, the ones who, for example, voted for Trump in 16, but Evers in 18, probably never dreamed that the Democratic Party of the state of Wisconsin was so anti-police and so pro-riot. And the reason they probably didn't believe it is until right now. We never really heard elected top-ranking Democratic officials bash the police so much or do so little when there were riots. It's a new thing, but it's clearly a thing. And it's clearly become their philosophy and ideology. In terms of Biden... Even if people are of the opinion that somehow Joe Biden isn't really soft on rioting and so on, this is where everyone understanding that Biden isn't really going to be the president and Biden is out of it comes to damage them because I think it's fairly clear that Kamala Harris and AOC, that they're all kind of on the same wavelength with regard to this stuff. The Democrats in their platform don't have anything in a crime. It's all bash the police, defund the police and so on. It's their issue. When it was theoretical, it was one thing. 
You get goofball things like the Badger Institute up there, you know, the left supposedly conservative organization. Wow, well, we can't be, continue to convict everybody and all that stuff. When all of a sudden you see this being put into practice, violent crime in Wisconsin is out of control. Cities like Kenosha burned out. Wauwatosa, the mayor, refusing to do anything to enforce any order because he doesn't want to offend protesters that are led by criminals. The People's Revolution in Wauwatosa, the organization that includes some Wauwatosa elected officials, one of their lead organizers is a convicted felon who has new open felony cases out there on him. When they see that type of insurrectionist allowed to destroy the quality of life of a community again and again and again, compounded by all the crap that's been going on in all of these other cities. It's no longer theoretical, it's real. Now, maybe this is all a big, giant nothing. Maybe Joe Biden carries Wisconsin. Maybe people that live, say, on the North Shore are watching this and they couldn't care less if the Democrats are for riots. And they figure, okay, fine, what do I care about Kenosha? It's not like they burned out Fox Point. But when you see Democrats themselves, and remember what I've always told you, and I know nobody ever does it, which is why I tell you again and again and again. When you see a story in the media, ask yourself why it's there. Why does Politico, a left-wing publication, have this story in which a number of Democrats are wringing their hands, they're fearful that Tony Evers is going to blow this state for Joe Biden? They're trying to get a message to people like Evers that you've got to change your tone and start cracking down. Now, that might happen. Evers does as he's told. And it might dawn on them that politically this has been a disastrous response. But remember, he's in that Madison bubble, and the people surrounding him are as radical as the people that are surrounding Joe Biden. This election in 2020 is going to be a watershed for a number of reasons. And one of them is... In the past, when the Democrats came around to run for president every four years, they kind of act like they're more moderate than they really are. They're not really acting that way this time out. All the radicalism is out there and on display. The pro-riot, the defund the police, it's all part of their agenda. So if they win, they can say, look, people voted for it. We'll see if they do. WISN, Mark Felling, late afternoon show. There's quite a buzz going on about a story that was broken by the Fox affiliate in Nashville. They got their hands, they must have filed an open records request, they got their hands on internal emails from the Nashville mayor and his administration. And they found out that in Nashville they covered up the coronavirus numbers in the downtown Nashville district. The reason they covered them up is after they reopened everything in Nashville, there was no surge at all. In fact, downtown Nashville's positive rate for COVID-19 is tiny. It's minuscule. And the Fox affiliate got their hands on emails saying that they were going to, the decision was made by the mayor to not release the information to the public because they didn't want people to realize that casual contact like going to bars and restaurants was not a way of spreading the virus. Now, my take on that is, you wonder how many other cities this happened. What has been very rare has been any scrutiny by the media and looking into how some of these public health officials have butchered coronavirus with their bad guidance and input. We saw, for example, in Florida, the Fox affiliates in Orlando and Tampa broke major stories when they were able to document that the testing numbers for coronavirus in Florida were way off because some labs were only turning in their positive numbers. Remember that one? Well, again, that was two TV stations in Florida that looked into that. How many other cases of labs around the country are doing the same thing? We don't have any of the media investigating it. Likewise, in Nashville... When there was no surge at all after they reopened the bars and the restaurants in coronavirus, and in fact the numbers went down, we now know that they covered it up because a TV station got their hands on the records to prove that. Again, it was a Fox affiliate. Do you think that might have gone on virtually everywhere else? We do know this. If they're not telling you there's a surge in a certain area, that means there isn't a surge in a certain area. 
all this stuff that we were told was going to happen. If you reopen the bars and restaurants in Wisconsin, there's going to be a surge. There's no surge connected with the bar and restaurant industry in Wisconsin. None. What you'll get is the same thing happening everywhere else in life. Maybe somebody will get the virus just as maybe somebody for a CPA firm or maybe somebody working at a hospital is going to get it. But there's been no particular outbreak at all. People say, well, I see people in these bars and restaurants not wearing masks. That's right. If you're drinking or eating, you don't have to wear the mask. It's not been correlated with any kind of a health risk because even though public health officials don't want to tell you this, casual contact is very unlikely to result in a transmission of the virus. Where is it being transmitted? College dorms. Why? Because it's no longer as close a casual contact. The kids who are in the college dorms, they know what's being transmitted there. They don't much care because they realize that COVID is the most overhyped situation of their lifetimes. The point that I'm on that nobody's ever going to pick up on, what's the other thing that happens a lot in college campuses, especially in dorms? Sex. Sex is a major way of transmitting coronavirus for reasons that are obvious. You don't have casual contact during sex. You have close physical contact with people that are pawing one another up, exchanging bodily fluids and everything else under the sun. My great revelation on that was what happened after Mardi Gras in New Orleans, where there was a massive spike right after Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras is debauchery. I don't know that everybody that goes down there has sex, but they all try to. And it's a lot of people from a lot of different places. Yes, there was an outbreak. College campuses, I don't know if moms and dads know this, but uh, there's a whole lot of messing around that goes on in those places. So you're going to see outbreaks. The casual contact thing that's been hyped from the beginning. When you don't hear a report of a major outbreak, that means it didn't occur. Kansas City Chiefs had a home football game last week. 12,000 fans were allowed to attend. Have you heard of any major outbreak from people who went to the Kansas City Chiefs game last week? No. What does that tell you? It tells you it didn't happen, meaning you can at the very least let sports fans start returning to the games with maybe one-third without having any risk at all. The Sturgis thing was instantly debunked. The rate of infection there was about the same rate as if those people had stayed home and surrounded other people. I actually thought the Sturgis thing would be a little bit higher than it was because I made a wrong assumption. I thought it'd be a little bit like Mardi Gras, that there'd be a whole lot of sex going on there. I'm told The reason apparently it didn't happen is I'm told that's a big couples thing. I didn't know that, did you? I didn't. I just thought it was a bunch of single guys like my age getting on their thing and, you know, and then a bunch of, like, biker chicks out there and they'd all hook up. Apparently it's a lot of husband and wife stuff, so. At all, well, I know older, but... Don't do what you don't think older people have sex. I I know all about what goes. I know what goes on down at the villages. I know all about that. Well, but I mean the transmission of the virus. And uh, uh, the point is, is that if a bunch of strangers who haven't had contact with one another start pawing one another up and do all the other things that occur, that is a way the virus gets transmitted. I mean. This thing is that not that much of a mystery to us anymore. If Paul's over there and I'm over here and one of us has it, chances are we're not going to give it to one another. On the other hand, if we shake hands, hug, or drink out of the same glass of water, almost certainly we're going to have it. If we're in the same dormitory and sharing all the same stuff, good chance that we're going to get it. But if some guy works in an office and some other guy works in an office and they just see one another, chances are you're not. You go to a restaurant and there's a person sitting across on the other side of the restaurant who has it, I'm probably not going to get it from them. On the the other hand, if we're sitting at the same table and drinking out of the same coffee cup, maybe maybe we would. I think that that's all fairly apparent uh, stuff. Yeah, so the, the point the point I think that's made here is whenever you see a situation in which you see that there isn't an outbreak of COVID, the people that have been hell bent on hyping COVID keep that from you. You wonder how many states you'd be able to find the same thing if there was aggressive reporting diving into the stuff that's being kept from us. I don't think Nashville's the only city in the United States where they noticed. The bars and restaurants are really nothing to worry about. The downtown area had no... And in Nashville, real quickly, in Nashville, that's one of the few cities in the United States that's been seeing any kind of tourism at all because it's a city that a lot of people drove to this summer 
and it's a city that had a fair amount of stuff opened up. So Nashville's a big tourist area. That's the kind of thing where you would risk there'd be an outbreak of COVID, people coming in from all over the place and so on, and they had no outbreak at all. In fact, the numbers were so low, the public officials conspired to cover them up as the Fox affiliate uh, demonstrated. News Talk 1130 WISN, Mark Belling, late afternoon show on yesterday's program. We mentioned that a sports talk show host, well-known guy from Chicago, got fired after he tweeted out, after one of the Monday Night Football games last week, or this week, I guess, Maria Taylor, the sideline reporter for ESPN at one of the two games, he said, she looks like she ought to be hosting... The ABN Awards show. That's one of the porn movie shows. That was it. They fired him. Since then, all of the other hosts at the station have supported the station's decision to fire the guy. I commented on yesterday's show that in this unbelievable wave of political correctness and speech codes that are going on, one of the reasons that it happens is when somebody is targeted, when they say something that they never would have dreamed would be a firing offense. They have no place to fall. They have no line of support. I mentioned that when the Sacramento Kings basketball broadcaster, Grant Napier, was fired, he was one of the first to go down here. He put out on social media, all lives matter, which is something that you can't say. If you didn't know, you can't say that. You can't say it. None of the other broadcasters, nobody else defended Napier. They all, oh, well, you know, I'm terrible. Now down in Chicago, all these people work with the guy. They don't want to be on the wrong side of being accused of sexist or racist or whatever the other reasons are that you couldn't make fun of what Maria Taylor was wearing. So they all turn against the guy themselves. We had a situation here a couple of weeks ago. Everybody knows that they were coming after Vicky. I would hope that if it happens to anybody here at WISN, all of the other talk show hosts would have the back of the person who was being unfairly targeted. I'm not talking about somebody who does something terribly indefensible or anything like that. But right now, the reason that the witch hunt environment that we have is so thriving is because nobody's defending the witch. That old term, witch hunt, how did it come? Well, it goes back to Salem, in which a bunch of people just decided that some young women were witches. And nobody wanted to defend them because they didn't want to be perceived as supporters of the so-called witches. The witch hunt is the demonizing of some people. And this is what is clearly happening in America under this so-called cancel culture. And usually the person who gets in trouble says something that's hard to defend. I thought Dan McNeil's comment about Maria Taylor was stupid. For the life of me, I don't know why a male would be objected objecting to an attractive woman addressing like an attractive woman. I'm all, I, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. So I think his comment was dorky. Do I think it's repugnant? I, I, he said she looks like she should, I mean, she should be hosting at a, 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 porn, a porn award show. That's it. And then it's sexist. Well, I don't know. If, is it sexist? If some male commentators out there wearing like a muscle, muscle shirt or something and you said that, would, would that I, I don't think anyone would object to that, right? Plus, well, plus, most white males generally don't care. And as for Maria Taylor herself, I look back to, I'm trying to remember who it was, Brett Musburger. He's an Alabama quarterback. His, his, me married her. She's now a, a, a sports reporter herself. Yeah. Yeah. She's now a sports reporter herself. Uh, must they show the Alabama quarter? Who was it? It was, uh, he was a bust. Uh, who was it? Best Alabama quarterback the last. Now it was before, uh, Jalen Hurts, the guy before him. Anyway, they showed, uh, his girlfriend, who's now a TV reporter herself. Uh, in the stands, and Musburger made some ridiculous old man comment. Oh, she looks pretty hot. A.J. McCarron, that's who it was. And McCarron's girlfriend, you know, some people say, oh, that's sexist, what Brett said. And McCarron's girlfriend said, hey, I'm flattered by it. Nobody lets anything roll off their back. Everything is deemed to be unbelievably offensive. 
And it's going to continue this way so long as nobody ever defends the people who get canned. And as I say, I get why they're not. If you are if you work at that station, and I guess it's the score is the name of the station in Chicago, and you're one of the other hosts that are on the air and you defend McNeil, you've got to be afraid they're t- they'll fire you. Now, I don't, it's so, I, you can just see what's going on. And as for the general public, nobody wants to rally to their defense either. You don't want to lose your job because nobody knows what you can't say anymore. If somebody on the left objects to what it is that you say, you don't get balled out. You don't get suspended. You don't get, hey, millionaire, you're done. And it's gotten to the point where even people like myself, who I have a vested interest in knowing exactly where that light is, so I don't fall on the wrong side of it. It's getting harder and harder to keep track other than to know that if you are a white male, particularly a conservative white male, they they will look for anything and use it as the reason to get rid of you. And the people like McNeil, who's probably a moron anyway and probably a liberal because he's a sports talk show host, he's even likelier to go down this route because he's not going to have many conservatives willing to defend him because, frankly, who cares about him? Standing up for Milwaukee, this is the Mark Belling Late Afternoon Show on News Talk 1130 WISN. You heard one of the commercials about blinders being on. I think that the media deliberately averts its eyes from a lot of stories and therefore is often slow to pick up on a lot of trends. Now, one of the things that I like to do on my show is to try to identify some of these trends and try to jump on them before everybody else does. We've been, for example, talking about the millennials since the millennials were like 20. (laughs) It's been about 16 years that we've kind of been identifying some of the things that have identified and made that generation what it is. The one that's been the mystery, because the millennials were so different than any generation prior to them. And liberal millennials, for example, so different than, say, liberal baby boomers. The liberal baby boomers were the ones who, anything goes, sex, drugs, rock and roll, let's go to Woodstock during the Hong Kong flu. Let's oppose any kind of authority that exists and... Liberal millennials today, the ones that are so safety conscious and want to follow every single rule there is and they become the rule Nazis. Anyway, so many of the other phenomena that have occurred with regard to, you know, millennials, they stay living with parents longer. They do things in groups. They don't want to have children. They seem to be averse to being married. They mostly wanted to work and live in cities. They like to hang in packs. All these things. What? has been a mystery of what was going to happen to the generation coming up after them. The thing about trends is people are very, very slow to pick up on the fact that the trend has changed. I go back to, we did a number of segments on the show back in 07, really starting in 05 and 06, and a lot of people discussed, was the housing market in a bubble? And I said, I didn't know. Remember, housing had done nothing but go up for like 10 years. And that's when you started to see all of these newfangled loans coming in where people were doing interest-only loans. They were getting these from the mortgage lenders that were allowing them to pay back so little that they were only paying the interest. They weren't knocking into the principal. The notion was because the principal was going to go up. Why pay off the principal when you just sell the house, you make the profit. In the meantime, your only payment is off the interest when you had the subprime mortgages that were coming in so the people who wouldn't even generally qualify for a mortgage, a way to get them in. And then the other thing, so many people wanted to get into the action. The mortgage industry was considered so secure that we created derivatives. There weren't enough actual mortgages for people to be able to invest in, so they started investing in a derivative, which is just a product created to match what was going on with a basket of mortgages. When the housing market started to show signs of some peaking and slippage, a lot of people, no, 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 it's just a, you know, it's just a little bit of a correction. This isn't a thing. This isn't a thing. This isn't a thing. It's hard to spot the reversal of a trend. I'll give you another one that's happening right now. No one knows what's going on with the tech stocks. Have they peaked or not? 
They really sold off for a few days, then rallied again, and now they sell it off again. Is it over for their run? Google, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, Netflix, all these stocks that have just exploded for years. Is it over? Or is this just a minor little hiccup where they're going to pause before taking off again? I don't know. But many people would be resistant to argue that it is over because it's very, very hard when there's been a trend in place for a long time to simply see that it has stopped. We do know, though, that in terms of human behavior, when trends stop, Each generation is different from the one before it. Now, sometimes it's not real apparent when the change is occurring because there are always the people that are straddling the two generations. For example, somebody who's 23 right now. They're right on the edge of the millennials and they're right on the edge of the Generation Zs. They'll probably show characteristics of both. Just as the oldest baby boomer was somebody born in 46. Those people are what? Let me do the math. 74 right now. They'd be different than somebody born well into the baby boom like myself. In other words, they kind of straddled the World War II generation and straddled into the baby boom. But still, throughout human history, each generation has shown significant differences from the one that came before them. Now, I think I know why that is. Do you think you know why that is? Why do generations change behavior? Well, they're not rebelling against their parents. The generation above them is usually a little bit less than their parents' age. Most of these generations last for about 20 years. Technology changes. I think it's this. There's a little bit of the rebellion. I think each generation reacts to the failures of the generation above them. And they're heavily influenced by them. Remember, for the millennials, the reason they were so safety conscious, these were the people that were young when 9-11 occurred. That freaked them out. And everybody reacted by freaking them out. This is the generation that the playgrounds had the wood chips and this, that, and the other thing. So, of course, they became a generation that was raised under a bubble. It was also the generation in which... We kept preaching the toxic masculinity in the schools and guys can't do this, guys can't do that. What a surprise. The guys turned out to be wimps and the women turned out to be barracudas. Well, who's watching that? Often their younger brothers and sisters, the people that are coming up behind them. They correct against the mistakes that were made by the people that are a little bit older than them or the things that were done by the people a little bit older than them that they simply do not approve of. But it's very hard to tell what they'll be. My observation, and we've made it a cottage industry on this program, commenting and focusing on the millennial generation, has simply been to watch them. Learn from what you say. I picked up on, early on, years ago, the behavior in the bars. Long as I've been alive, guys in bars hit on women. I don't know if my parents' generation did it, but I know that's how my father met my mother. <laughs> how did your father meet your mother? What do you mean? You, you must know. Uh, what? It was at a bar. It's that so it's the same way, right? Well, yeah, And I'm guessing your father made the first move, right? Uh, the story I heard from my family is that's how my father met my mother. They were at a bar. And, uh, it, I mean, it's just not fathomable that back in that era, you know, when my parents are meeting, what would that have been, 1621? <laughs> and that was the case certainly throughout my upbringing. And when I was a younger person, you go into a bar, a guy's going to hit on a woman. I mean, sometimes women would flirt, but the guys, just, it's just what guys do. Strike out 97 times and hope once you're going to hit the ball. And it was probably the case with Paul. Anyway, what I noticed about 10 to 15 years ago in the bars is that the guys weren't hitting on the women. The women were out there drinking shots, slamming down shots. And there's a guy, and the guy, this is like 15 years ago, stroking his beard, wearing a plaid shirt and nursing their Miller Lite. That, and by the way, never buy a drink for a woman. It just, it was an interesting cultural revelation. And 
We've expanded and built on it for years. Well, that's how I picked up on these guys are different and these women are different. I saw it. Observing the differences between the Generation Zs, which is the term we're using so far. They haven't come up with a better one. For the people that are about 22 and under, they're the kids that are in high school, the ones that are entering college, maybe concluding college right now, the ones right behind the millennials. Now, one observation that I've made that I'm convinced I'm going to be right about is this is the generation that is going to, in large numbers, reject college. And that's going to be a disaster for these universities because the Generation Zs by number are smaller than the millennials. The birth rate started to decline with them. They have seen, and again, what do they react to? The excesses of the generation before them. They saw all of these millennials get beaten down with incredible amounts of student loan debt. And then so many of them getting underemployed. And in the meantime, they're seeing an economy in which the job demand is overwhelming for the skilled trades, things that don't necessarily require a college education. So I don't think this generation, you know, that many of the cases, their older siblings were the ones that sitting there with a $125,000 loan and whining about it every time they talked to mom. They're going to avoid that, I think. I identified earlier in the week a remarkable difference in these two generations in how they are approaching coronavirus. Since then, I have been overwhelmed with reaction from people who have noticed the same thing. And they're all offering the same, you know, similar versions of the same story. Let me share with you two. One, Mark, I was listening to your segment about the generational divide between Gen Z and the millennials on yesterday's show, and it is quite interesting. This is the most stark divide and the largest generation gap we have seen thus far between these two people. I am wondering if this is just the beginning of a larger trend. We know that Generation Zers are less likely to attend college, less afraid of their shadows, and more likely to take a gap year after high school. I think all the evidence of 2020 will exacerbate these trends. There is almost no point to attending college in person when you see Marquette quarantine an entire dorm. Why pay the money to go to college without a college experience? Not to mention the shifting economy and job market that makes most college degrees irrelevant. Most young Americans have always had some rebellion ingrained in them and always like to be different than the generation that came before them. That was the point I was making. I think that moment has arrived. In the past, we have seen generations like my own, I'm a millennial, this is what the letter writer says, rebel against conservative and traditional values such as sex, gender, and drugs. Now we live in a culture utterly dominated by leftists and liberalism is the norm. We live in an era where, when, where white liberal teachers will condemn students for not towing the liberal line and harangue students about how they need to be woke. My point here is that to be a rebel today is to be conservative and not buy into the overwhelming leftist ideology. So that begs the question I have for you. Do you think the events of 2020 and the ridiculousness of the millennials will drive Generation Z over to conservatism? Well, my answer is I don't know. But I think in some areas the answer is likely to be yes, because each generation, in they're not different in every area, but they're different in many areas than this one. Mark, I'm catching up from your podcast for the week. I'm a 36-year-old. I want to confirm your observation that millennials are absolutely terrified of COVID. And it seems like the Generation Z group is not nearly as afraid. I go out to bars and restaurants quite frequently. The 25 and younger crowd is packed into bars where I live, the Quad Cities. That's the area of where Illinois and Iowa come together, four cities. He says the 25 and under crowd is packing into the bars there. Meanwhile, the people of my age and up are terrified and wear masks constantly. We've seen this with regard to young people. These kids that are in college, they're just mocking the COVID thing. They think it is ridiculous in the quarantine. They show, And again, it's a generalization. I'm sure some kids are afraid. They're, they think that it's a complete overreaction. They have no fear of this whatsoever. At the younger ages, they are the ones that want to get back into school on an in-person thing. It's the people 10, 15 years older than them that are scared to death of the whole thing. So perhaps 
the first big sign we're seeing of a difference between these two generations is the millennials who are safety conscious, terrified of everything, and so willing to accept whatever the authority figures will tell them that the Generation Zers are going to be just the opposite, much more risk-oriented and much more determined to not abandon the type of experiences that the millennials have been so willing to give up. The college thing, I, I just, for these colleges right now to be making college as miserable as, as they are, quarantine, you can't have fun, there's no food, you can't go to any sporting events, you can't hang out, you can't do this, that, or the other thing. At the same time that the enrollment is going down, enrollments are going down, the demographics show that there's going to be fewer kids. The one thing that they ought to be doing is trying to make college the greatest thing in the world for these people, and instead, they're taking the people that are introduced that are being introduced to college right now and they're making it absolutely horrible and miserable all because a bunch of old farts are somehow terrified that a bunch of 20 year olds are going to get COVID. And it's pretty clear most of these 20, 20 year olds couldn't care less about COVID. They see right through it. They think it's a crack. They think it's something old men get and die from. They have no fear of it. News Talk, 1130 WISN, Mark Belling, late afternoon show. It's a little bit after 545 on Thursday, but it's time for the Mark Belling weekend football preview. We're going to do it right around this time every Thursday afternoon. Take a brief look at some of the football games to be played this weekend. And I'm going to be joined every week by Mike Merlet of American Sports Analyst in Madison. Mike, good afternoon. Before we get started, is there anything you'd like to share with the uh, audience that ASA is going on or you'd like to pass along this week? Sure. Uh, we've gotten off to a really good start in football. We're three and zero in college, two and one in the NFL, so five and one overall. Um, we'll have our first big play top game this weekend in college football. I think it's a really good situation. Anyone interested, just give us a ring in the office or go to our website. And their website is asawins.com and one eight eight two seven two ten ninety eight is the telephone number. Our contest is sponsored every week by Holiday Automotive in Fond du Lac. It's worth the drive. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about what we saw in the first week of the NFL, college football, and also the interesting news that the Big Ten is going to join the bandwagon of most major Division I college football programs and have a season after all. Let's start with pro football. Um, Green Bay Packers played the Minnesota Vikings. It was a weird game in that it started a little bit slowly in terms of the offense, but throughout the entire game, the Packers seemed to be the dominant team until the end of the game. The defense looked very good and the offense looked unstoppable. Your take on the Packers, was it, are the Packers that good or are the Vikings that bad or is it just one of those kind of week one things where maybe the game wasn't as revealing as it seemed to be? Yeah, I think one thing that we always uh, are a bit careful of, especially in the NFL, is not overreacting to one week, especially week one. I mean, if you look back in the past, you'll, you'll see teams in week one that looked great, and then by week eight you look back and say, how did they do that in week one? It just things change so fast. In that game in particular, Green Bay offense looked really good. Their defense, their defense gave up more yards per play last week than any other team in the NFL by almost a full yard. Um, so their defense was was not good. Well, a lot some of that, that though, late. the fourth quarter when they either were, yeah. I, I, I had the impression both defenses, and maybe it was the lack of training camp, that both defenses were just tired in the fourth quarter, and offenses were running by them. Yeah, I think I think if I remember correctly, both teams scored the last six possessions were all touchdowns. Yeah, thirty eight so points in the fourth quarter combined. Yeah. Yeah, so obviously both defenses were worn down. Minnesota's defense is going to take a step back. They lost almost half their starters from last year. Their top three defensive backs um, and their top defensive end didn't play last week. So it'll be interesting this week, Green Bay playing Detroit. Uh, I've said this before, but it's a little bit of a dangerous game, I think, for Green Bay. Detroit's played them really well in the past. If you look back to last year, both Green Bay, this is the craziest stat I've ever seen, and maybe you've talked about this or heard about this. Green Bay won both games last year against Detroit, 23 to 20 and 23 to 22, and technically never led once in either game. Both were they they trailed or were tied, and they scored on the on the field goal as time expired on both in both games. So um, it, that that's a very interesting stat to me. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Yeah, and uh, you had a situation in which Detroit, if they lose, is staring at 0 and 2, and they have to just be 
frustrated over it. They gave that game away to the Bears. They had not only had a big lead in the fourth quarter that they gave up, they essentially threw a touchdown pass at the end of the game, and the receiver just dropped it. I mean, Detroit has to be incredibly frustrated, and I know it's an odd season, but you don't want to be 0-2 with two losses to within your division. Detroit is, they're behind a terrible eight ball only two weeks in if they lose, so one would think they'd be highly motivated. On the other hand, the Packers' offense, it just seemed like Every play, the receiver was open. Rodgers had only 11 incompletions, but two of them were drops that were planted right in the hands of Valdez Scantling. So the Packers look good, but Detroit seems to me to be a team that they're in desperate need of a win in a game that they really should have won last week. Yeah, for sure. They led 23-6 to in the fourth quarter last year, uh, last weekend and just blew that game. And as you mentioned, dropped a touchdown pass. Um, this has been a close series. Uh, uh, Detroit's covered six in a row in this series. I've just got a, I've got a feeling, you know, with no home field advantage, really, I, I think this game is going to go to the wire. I just do. I think it's going to be a close game. I would take Detroit if I could get it at seven or more just to be safe right now. It's sitting at six, six and a half. I may wait and see. Um, but I, I think it's going to be a close game. I really do. Anything else that struck you in the NFL last week? Somebody looked particularly good. Somebody looked particularly bad that you thought would be better than they were. Was there a, an impression on a team or two you'd like to share? Well, one one team that might have looked good, but really offensively wasn't that good, uh, surprisingly, was New Orleans. They won last week. They beat um, They beat Tampa Bay, scored 34 points in the game but didn't even have 300 yards of offense. They had like 280 yards of offense, barely over four yards per play. Breeze looked, didn't look great, looked old, looked old, 18 completions for like 160 yards. And the crazy part about that game is Brady starting his first time, not not under center for New England, but for a different team, didn't, didn't look good. He threw three interceptions, or two interceptions, including a pick six. And Lee and I were Those talking. Those two interceptions about were the two big plays of the game. The reason New Orleans won, yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's the reason they won because really, stat wise, and it's not all about stats all the time, but uh, Tampa Bay outplayed New Orleans last week. Um, and New Orleans scored so many points and didn't do a lot on offense. I, I, it'll be interesting to watch New Orleans this week at Las Vegas. That if that would have been a game with fans, that would have just been a. A, a huge game in Las Vegas without fans. That just it takes some of the luster away. But that that'll be an interesting game to me to watch New Orleans and see if they can improve on offense. Even though it looks like they played well on offense, but they didn't. And that that is the Monday night game. Uh, let's talk about yeah, college Monday. football. And before we get into any games, let's talk about the situation with the Big Ten and Wisconsin, where they announced this week that they are going to have a season after all. I just think that. There's such financial pressure on these athletic department budgets, and the Big Ten looked around them and realized, I believe the only two conferences now that aren't planning to go are the Mountain West and the Pac-12. Everybody else is playing. The SEC starts next week, and the ACC is already playing. The Big 12 in the same part of the country, they're playing. The American Conference is playing. Conference USA is playing. Even the Sun Belt is playing. Everybody else is playing, and these Big Ten schools had to be wondering, well, what point are we trying to establish by starting as late as they will though they're still going to be waiting an entire month give me some thoughts on whether or not they're going to be able to be up to speed with everybody else now the one thing about the big 10 is they're all in the same boat they're all only going to be playing conference games so they'll be playing other teams that have the same late start as well but any any thoughts about how this will play itself out and the decision of the big 10 to get started late but actually have a fall season well, that's an interesting situation, actually, because I don't, I'm not 100% positive, but I think that uh, they, they have to vote, not the Big Ten, but a bunch of the, I'm not sure if it's athletic directors or how it works, to let the Big Ten into the, into the potentially into the playoffs yet. So because they're starting later than everyone. And so I've heard some people kind of start complaining how the Big Ten's not going to be worn down as other conferences because they're starting later. They're only playing eight games, or it's going to be nine games, and they're going to possibly waltz right into the playoffs. So that has yet to be decided. I'm almost positive they will be. They're not going to vote. Whoever votes isn't voting against Well, I that. think that the Big Ten realized that if they didn't play football, they might not get a cut of the national championship money given the fact that most of the leagues were going to play. So it was another reason for them to get in. I mean, for Wisconsin fans... 
I know a lot of Badger fans really hope there is a season because Wisconsin looks again to be rather loaded and looks like they should be a competitive team, although they'll be playing almost certainly without any fans at Camp Randall for any of the home games. Uh, have they started practicing yet? And have you gotten any kind of a feel for how quickly they can get up to speed? You know, there won't be any non-conference games. The first game they play in, I guess, the weekend of the 17th of October is going to be a conference game. Yep, that, that's actually been moved to the October 23rd, 24th weekend. Is they're going to be the first Big Ten games? And they have been practicing just mainly conditioning type stuff. No pads, just helmets, that type of stuff. It sounds like within seven to ten days, Wisconsin specifically, and I'm assuming all the Big Ten teams will start working with pads, and all should be ready to go toward the end of October. Um, now, so do I they have a schedule that... yet? The old schedule apparently is not operative, but are they going to play what was the same teams in the order they were going to play, or have you heard anything on that? No, they're not saying. They're 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 kind of keeping it under wraps. They're sp- the schedule is supposed to be out this week at some point, so I'm assuming tomorrow at some point. But as of right now, there's not an official schedule, so I'm not sure how it's going to play out. So we can't really look ahead at anything Big Ten-wise until they do that. Uh, Holiday Automotive and Fond du Lac is the sponsor of our contest. It's worth the trip. Is their logo line up. Any game in college football this week that you'd like to highlight for us that you think is an interesting one or you might have an opinion you'd like to share on? Yeah, there's not a lot going on in college still. Uh, one thing that we've looked at, we started 3-0 and in college. Last week we went 2-0. and We had Arkansas State as a big underdog beat Kansas State straight up, and we had Coastal Carolina as an underdog beat Kansas straight up. So we had two nice underdogs win outright. One thing that we've had to adjust a little bit is because of the shortened practice time, we've actually looked back into spring trainings, or, uh, spring training, not spring training, spring football situations. So like last week, Coastal Carolina was playing uh, against Kansas. Kansas had zero spring practice uh, practices. Coastal Carolina had 15. So that, that's like, that's a lot of practice time coming in. And then when the practice time was short and leading into the season, we thought that gave Coastal Carolina a big advantage. There are other things that go into it, but that's interesting to look at. And I believe teams with that had much more spring practice were like 6-2 and two against the spread last week. So that's one thing that we look at early in the season. One quick game that we like this weekend, we like, we like Southern Miss a little bit against Louisiana Tech um, in, in Conference USA. Southern Miss played two weeks ago and lost. They were a big favorite at home and lost. Didn't look good. Their coach stepped aside after that game. Um, they've hired a guy interim that was on the staff that the players really seemed to like. He was at Division Three a few years ago and had a, had an offense that averaged 50 points a game. He's he's supposed to be a really good offensive coach. Meanwhile, Louisiana Tech hasn't played a game. They had a bunch of COVID cases. Um, a few weeks ago, so they were supposed to play Baylor, so that game got canceled. It's disrupted their practice. Certain players can practice, certain can. Some may be back, some may not. It's just a, it's a good situation with a team that's played a game, was embarrassed at home. They're back at home against a team that has had very little practice time to get ready for this game. So I think Southern Miss is probably worth a look this weekend. Okay, uh, is there an NFL game that you told me that uh... – if the Lions were actually a seven-point underdog, you'd be attracted to that. Is there any other game in the NFL that maybe you'd like to give us some I time? actually, you know, after watching the, the Giants on Monday, I actually like the Giants a little bit against the Bears. Giants are plus five and a half, plus six in that game. And Chicago's not a team that should be laying points like that against anyone with Trubisky at quarterback. He had a good fourth quarter last week. And a terrible um, first three quarters, right. Terrible first three quarters. Giants, actually, we had under in the Pittsburgh Giants game Monday, which came in. Giants looked okay on offense. Jones looked okay on offense against possibly the best defense in the NFL. Pittsburgh's defense is fantastic. Um, I just think that's too many points. I think this game's going to go down to the wire. Last year, a 19-15 to final, so it was low scoring. Uh, makes it tough to cover a bigger number. I just don't trust Chicago laying that many points. I, I think the Giants will probably take them to the wire, so I'd look at I'd look at the Giants getting five and a half or six points. And, and finally, in both college and pro football, I've been under this the, the theory that, especially in the pros, there isn't home field advantage. Did you evaluate any results? Did it appear in either college or professional football there, in fact, still is a home field advantage, or what were you able to pick up on that? No, we're, we're going moving forward with very little. Like, it's going to have to be team by team. 
one one NFL team that did have a little bit of a home field advantage was Jacksonville. Jacksonville put people in the stands last week. It was one of the few teams that did. And actually, from everything we heard, they made a difference. And they ended, they ended up uh, upsetting Indianapolis last week. Most teams aren't going to have any. So I, I, we're going to move forward with mainly no home field advantage, but on a team-by-team basis. But be aware of the t- teams in which fans are going to be there. Kansas City had 12,000, and you said Jacksonville had some, and then there are others where there aren't any. Okay, we'll talk to you next week, Mike. Thanks. That's Mike Thanks, Mark. America. We'll see you. Presented by Holiday Automotive and Fond du Lac, it is worth the trip. I think I said it's worth the drive the first time around. Well, maybe it's not worth the drive, but it's worth the trip. <laughs> said all of that uh, correctly. Paul, did you any have, have any observations? I've, my big one was I just noticed in the NFL, college football, hard for me to get a feel on, that all sorts of teams are tired in the fourth quarter. And I look at that game between the Bears and the, and the Lions. I think Detroit was the better team, but they were tired in the fourth quarter, and the Bears came back. And beat them. The Packer Viking game, I just, you know, both teams couldn't stop anybody in the fourth quarter. I think that they were tired. It was a lack of conditioning. So that's the thing that I draw. I think the telling thing for most of those teams in the NFL is how they look for the first three weeks because the conditioning thing will, over the long run, take care of itself. And Mike makes the comment that he thinks that the Giants perhaps would beat the Bears this coming weekend. I think that that's probably um, a pretty good pick. So. That's my big comment. Do you have anything you want to offer us or not? Paul says Detroit's really, really bad. Now, see, I don't, I, I, I'm at a loss this year because I don't have the NFL Sunday tickets because I haven't seen these games. I just, they have lost the receiver. On the other hand, as I said, they had the Bears whipped for three quarters. And to me, that's, to me, that's more telling than what happened in the fourth quarter. And I did see. The, player, with the the lion receiver. I mean, Stafford put the ball right in his hands. He dropped the pass in the end zone. I mean, what? Uh, yeah, and uh, Cephas dropped a ball. Uh, the old Badger dropped a ball in there. I suspect Detroit. Uh, I actually think Detroit will give the Packers a pretty good game because I think they're probably pretty good. I think the worst team in the division. And again, I don't want to overreact to Week One, but Minnesota looked terrible. And I know that they've looked good forever, but as Mike said, they lost a lot of players and. Uh, that Packer game was not as close as the score would indicate. I look at Green Bay as having beaten the Vikings by three touchdowns. It was just a weird fourth quarter that allowed Minnesota to get close, and they kept going for two and all that junk the end. But they never got it to within one possession. Even in the end, at nine points, it was still a two-possession game and a rather easy Green Bay win. News Talk, 1130 WYSN, Mark Belling, late afternoon show. important segment here sometimes we build up the opposition to being stronger than they are sometimes football fans do that sometimes we do that in politics i have argued that the strength of the democrats is their ruthlessness they try so hard their weakness is their ideology And often they are tone deaf and not understanding that the country is not with them. You see this right now, I believe, in their softness on crime and their seeming support of rioters and opposition to police. It is impossible not to watch the Biden campaign and realize how screwed up it is. Most people can't get past the first obvious screw up that Joe's lost his marbles. But if you go beyond that, I think they don't know what to do with him. They know they have to put him out there because they recognize that Trump's running around everywhere and they can't just create this impression that Joe is too enfeebled to even campaign. But everything's awkward. Two moments from the campaign trail yesterday. Biden yesterday had what they were calling an Hispanic heritage rally. Did you see this? So when they came out, they showed Biden, they played, they played a Latino song as Biden came out. The song is called Despacito. Are you familiar with Despacito? Do you know what Despacito means? It means slowly. Furthermore, so you got Joe Biden, the slowest person that there is, and the song that they're playing to people who would actually understand the meaning of the song since it was a Latino audience, says slowly. Further than that, do you know what Despacito is doing slowly? Take a guess. 
What would be the worst possible thing to draw attention to if Joe Biden is out there on stage? How about somebody that's kind of groping up and pawing on women? The translation of the lyrics is, Slowly I want to breathe in your neck. Let me murmur things in your ear. Slowly I want to undress you in kisses. Slowly. That's the song they play for Biden to come out there. Now, we can't blame it on Biden. I mean, they could have been playing the national anthem, and Joe Biden would not have known what song it was. Then, they had one of these things. Trump's people have been doing some of these things where they've been holding car parades and boat parades and so on. In fact, that boat parade on the Kauachi Lake, there's a zillion great video. Have you seen any of those out on social media? Yeah, Paul says he has all of those things. They had a car parade yesterday featuring the two spouses. Kamala Harris's husband and Joe Biden. And they posted it on the Biden Harris Twitter account. Did you see it? Do you know how many cars are in the car parade? There are three! One car comes by and there the two of them are waving. There's another one. There's a third. And then the campaign came and comes out and they, they posted that. That's a campaign that screwed up. You don't post that. I want to move over to, and I'm not going to overreact to this development. Rasmussen is one of the pollsters worth following. Rasmussen was one of only two major polling firms to get the election results right in 2016. The Rasmussen methodology is different from that of other pollers. Rasmussen does not human, use human beings to do the poll. It's an automated telephone-only poll. If you support Biden, press 1. If you support Trump, press 2, etc. If you think President Trump's doing a spectacular, strongly approved, press 1. Somewhat approved, press 2. Dis, somewhat disapproved, press 2. In other words, that's how the poll is structured. Rasmussen believes that doing the polling automated like that, you are less likely to get a biased result because you don't have bias in the asking of the questions. I believe the reason Rasmussen's polling has generally been more positive of Trump is I think there are so many people that are unwilling to say aloud that they support Donald Trump, but they're willing to say it to a machine. That's my theory. There's also the differences on how they construct their models. You know, how many Republicans do you call? How many Democrats? Anyway. Today's daily Rasmussen tracking poll, and remember, it's a daily poll, it's updated daily. So you can't overreact to any one day. The Rasmussen tracking poll for the first time now shows Donald Trump leading Joe Biden. Now again, I grant you this poll is an outlier. The other polls don't show that. But in 2016, Rasmussen had Trump doing way better than any of the other polls, and he was right. The Daily Rasmussen tracking poll now has Trump 47, Biden 46. The other 7% are either undecided to say that they'll vote for somebody else. I wouldn't overreact to it. On the other hand, I wouldn't pretend that the poll didn't exist. News Talk 1130 WISN, Mark Belling, late afternoon show. Really appreciate that promo that Paul played for the football picking contest. If you want to wait 167 hours and 55 minutes, we'll have that thing on there. Paul's going to claim that's not his fault, right? <laughs> You're not, well, whose fault is it? It's somebody in the promotions department or... We, 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 we've got a lot of things here that I don't understand. Anyway, I received a very well-written letter from a very frustrated young woman who attends Okadabwak High School. I'm pretty sure she'd love me to read her name, but because she's a kid and I'm not sure that her parents want that to happen. I'm not going to do it, but her name is Carolyn. And she writes extensively about what happened last night at the Oconomowoc School Board meeting. Oconomowoc, even though it is in western Waukesha County, the junior high, rather the junior high school and the high school are still not open. And many parents and kids are extremely frustrated, especially since the vast majority of Waukesha County schools, in fact, have opened. Two reasons to bring this topic up to end the show here. First, I think back to when I was a kid. All you ever were looking for was an excuse not to have school. What I have noticed 
from so many kids, and maybe it's a function of the fact that they lost the whole almost final two months of their year last year. The majority of these kids seem to want school to come back. Again, this is a big generational divide for the millennials. The Zs seem to want to go to school and seem to value their education, and they seem to be tuning out the fear-mongering of the adults who are preaching to them. Again, a contrast to the millennials. If you're looking for the thing that divides the communities that have opened schools and those that have closed, and as I mentioned earlier, Pius XI pulled the plug and closed today because one kid tested positive. When the decision makers are far more focused than what the teachers, the faculty, and the staff want, they're going to close the schools. When the decision makers are more focused than what's good for the kids and their parents, they're going to keep them open. So if you're sending your kids to a school where they are more interested in the well-being of the faculty and staff and their desires, you're sending your kids to a school where the people running the school don't really care about the kids. And I think a lot of these kids in Generation Z have figured that out, that many of the people who run their schools and many of the people who run their institutions...